I don't mean to imply that every Muslim agent of civilization, so to speak, agent in its Latin sense of one who does something, was all the time conscious of all these notions. Said, oh, um, I have to make one. I have to, uh, I'm thinking of tasheer or unity of knowledge. That's not how it happens. What Islam did, and once again, like any other civilization uh, before Islam or after Islam, Islam created a climate in which it became easy for Muslims to create these uh, civilizational products. So consciously or unconsciously, they embarked on this uh, mission or project. should also point out that uh, Muslims uh, uh, were, were, were quite open to borrowing from other civilizations. And there was no insistence, there was no uh, cutting off, saying, oh, oh no, we, we, we have to start from scratch one. No. Muslims borrowed uh, heavily from the existing um, civilizations, uh, Byzantine on the one hand, you see the influence of uh, Byzantine architecture in Muslim architecture, from uh, Sasanians, that is to say, Persian, um, Zoroastrians, they translated their literature, um, Greek sources, uh, philosophy, medicine especially, Indian mathematics, astronomy, numbers, what are known as Arabic numerals, uh, to which Muslims added the zero. So uh, we have to keep in mind this uh, readiness on the part of Muslims to borrow uh, whatever was of use. And in this too, uh, their guide was um, the Islamic teaching. Um, there's a hadith which says, Al Hikmatu da latul mu'min. Wisdom is um, a believer's stray camel. This means that. Wisdom is the property of uh, the believers. It belongs to them. And if it is found in some other uh, place, land, country, then they can lay claim to it because it's just like their own camel that had strayed from them. And when they see, oh, this, the, this belongs to me. This is my camel. I own it. In other words, there should be no bar against um, taking good, useful uh, things, elements from other cultures. Anything that qualifies as wisdom, whether it's philosophical wisdom or um, scientific wisdom, it does not matter. It belongs to uh, Muslims. Muslims have, should have no hesitation in uh, taking it, owning it, and developing it. And there should be no feeling of foreignness as such. Because ultimately, wisdom is a gift from God, and God gives that gift to all nations of the world. So wherever Muslims find wisdom, it's their stray camel. Yes? Uh, there was an article in the New York Times about four years ago, which taught the big feature on the science page was the closing of Islamic science or the closing of the Islamic mind. And the, if I can remember right, the basic premise of the article was in the under the Ottoman Empire there was a period of time where religious scholars 
turned away from that idea of openness and became very narrow in terms of their definition of how knowledge could be pursued. Yeah. Uh, there's some truth to that. Um, in, in law, there's um, a famous saying that the law of um, the gate of independent thinking which we had was closed in the 10th century. That's very often uh, uh, cited. Now, technically, that is uh, not correct uh, because there were a number of uh, great legists and thinkers um, who lived in post 10th century and there are scholars who have written on this subject while bin Halak is um, at McGill University and he has a very long convincing article that he has written the title something like the closing of the gate of Ijtihad mm -hmm. I think a question mark so he takes issue with this but this is uh, a popular understand now um, I will say this and one has to be uh, careful and fair about one cannot say that the gate of uh, ijtihad or independent thinking in law and other fields was uh, closed see one reason that is given is that later Muslim thinkers felt that all the important work that had to be done had been done mm -hmm. all we can do now is um, offer an exposition of their ideas and accomplishments so you have uh, scholarship of uh, a lesser quality and that is basically true. But while there were many, many individual uh, Muslim thinkers who kept on working and producing uh, uh, knowledge in the post 10th century era, I think in principle one can see, it's very evident, that the flood of scholarly activity that we see in the earlier centuries um, is nowhere to be seen today. That is quite true. That's two. Number three, one also has to um, keep in mind that Muslim contribution to civilization are uh, ongoing. They, they are being made as we speak. However, the context of those contributions has uh, changed. Um, it was a Muslim who built the Sears Tower, a Bangladeshi architect. And Muslims have contributed um, in arts and sciences. Uh, uh, some people, Dr. Shafi, would say that uh, Muslims are to be counted among the top 5% uh, uh, in many scientific fields. So Muslims are doing this work, but you see, the, the civilizational context for which you need bless you, for which you need a society that sets down parameters for this activity that is uh, missing today so you have um, uh, people who are capable of doing uh, nobel laureate style work and they are teaching at western universities but their work somehow gets lumped under, um, see, Western advancement in science and technology. So uh, the site or locus has been changed. And I think it's necessary for any civilization, because you see the word civilization uh, comes from the Greek word kiwis, which means um, a city. You need to have a city, you need to have a site, you need to have a land. Physical area in which uh, conditions are conducive for um, bringing into being uh, these products of civilization. And that is uh, what is missing today. And Muslims are um, imitating 
very badly in many cases uh, the models set by uh, the West, but they're not doing it creatively in their own countries. So whether it's education or anything else, uh, they look to the West. So I think there is uh, some justification uh, in saying that the creativity of uh, Muslims today is on a much uh, lower and lesser level than it was um, in earlier times.